The Lost Boys is a 1987 American horror film directed by Joel Schumacher, starring Corey Haim, Jason Patrick, Kiefer Sutherland, Jamie Gertz, and Corey Feldman. The film is about two brothers, Haim and Patrick, who move to a fictional California beach town called Santa Carla. Before long, they come to find out that Santa Carla, famous for the shocking number of missing people, is actually a hunting ground for four young male vampires, led by Kiefer Sutherland. Its depiction of vampires as young and attractive would forever change how vampires were shown on screen, paving the way for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Twilight, Underworld, and scores of other TV shows and movies. No doubt The Lost Boys is an important film, but what if I told you it was true? What if what was depicted in that film was actually happening right now. In 2003, paranormal researcher and prolific author Brad Steiger received a letter from a man named Carter involving a strange encounter that he had had. The event involved three other people and a strange group of teenagers. It was autumn 2003, Seattle, Washington. Carter and his girlfriend Suzanne had picked up another couple, Greg and Karen, for a planned evening out, dinner, a movie, and possibly visiting a bar afterwards. It was while leaving their first stop, a seafood restaurant, that Carter noticed a group of teens in the park. There were four of them. They looked like a bunch of teenagers just lounging around the park near the restaurant on a Saturday night. No school the next day. No dates. Nothing to do. Just hanging out, he told Steiger. Carter opened the door for Suzanne and walked around to the driver's side. As he was getting behind the wheel, Suzanne asked if he knew the boys in the park. He indicated that he had never seen them before, to which Suzanne noted that one of the teens had actually called his name. Carter, puzzled, looked in the direction of the park and observed that they were now walking towards his car. At this point, Greg, in the back seat, suggested that they leave. He assumed that they might be looking to cause trouble. Suzanne laughed, pointing out that they were probably just bored teenagers, but Greg was insistent that they must leave immediately. He thought that the teens must have heard Carter's name when they left the restaurant, and one of them had called his name to gain proximity for a possible robbery. He knew that it was a common ploy for criminals, whatever their ages, to attempt to deceive their victims with a sense of familiarity. As I backed out of our parking space, I made eye contact with the boy who appeared to be the leader. I wished that I had not done so. His eyes were like black marbles. When I glanced at the other boys, they too seemed to have no ordinary pupils, just black marbles. I felt a shiver run through me, Carter recalled. As they quickly left the parking lot, Greg asked if Carter had spotted any guns or other weapons on the teens. Carter indicated that he had not seen any weapons, but he was stunned by their eyes. Did any of you see their eyes? They were solid black, he asked his friends. Apparently none of them had noticed. Even though it was twilight, Suzanne insisted that they were most likely wearing sunglasses, noting that her younger brother often wore sunglasses at night. Carter eventually brushed it off. Their next stop was the movie theater to see a film. Afterwards, the four exited the theater and stood outside discussing the film that they had just watched. As they chatted, Carter looked over and spotted, leaning against the wall of the Chinese restaurant across the street, the same four teenagers they had seen in the park earlier. He alerted his friends who asked, almost in unison, how did they get there and how did they know what movie they were going to see? The four boys waved at them, an exaggerated gesture of friendliness that immediately creeped them out. They all wore broad, sinister smiles. One of them even called over, asking how they enjoyed the movie. Carter asked his friends if any of them had noticed that they had a car when they came out of the restaurant. Had any of them noticed that they were being followed? Sadly, his friends had not noticed. Suzanne, who had remained pretty carefree through the night, suddenly began to sense something ominous was at play and she urged them to get to the car and get out of there immediately. As I looked at the four teenagers leaning against the wall, I couldn't help thinking of Kiefer Sutherland and his vampire gang in the old movie, The Lost Boys. 
We got into the car as soon as possible, and I drove to one of our favorite watering holes on the edge of the city. I was determined to get as far away from the teenage terrors as possible. Greg kept looking in the back seat all the way to the bar to see that we weren't being followed. Upon leaving the bar at 1 a.m., the four friends were shocked to see the same four teenagers were sitting on the curb across the street. Greg wanted to call the cops. Suzanne wanted to go straight home, Carter recalled. Karen assumed that it was all some sort of a prank. She insisted that one of us had the most stupid sense of humor in the world and that we had just set up the whole thing. One of us had given the teenagers our itinerary for the evening. It was all just a stupid joke, she thought. They immediately left. During their ride home, Carter and Greg managed to convince Karen that it was not a joke and they had no idea what was going on. Carter dropped Greg and Karen off at their respective apartments and he and Susan headed home. Unlike Karen, Susan knew that what was happening wasn't a joke. Both she and Carter were frightened and they barely spoke during their ride home. We had not been home for more than a few minutes when someone rang the doorbell. We live on the first floor and the steps lead from the street right up to our door. I looked out the peephole, knowing exactly who I was going to see. It was the Lost Boys, their black eyes reflecting the lights from the street. The one I determined to be their leader was leaning on the door. The other three sprawled on the steps. The leader asked Carter to open the door. Carter replied simply that that wasn't going to happen and insisted that they leave or he'd call the cops. The leader then asked to be let in to use the telephone, suggesting that they only needed to make one call to someone who was going to come and pick them up. When that didn't work, he asked if they could use the bathroom. Finally, he settled on food, pointing out that they were all hungry and they only wanted a little snack. Carter, baseball bat in hand, remained standing on the other side of the door, saying no to each request and ordering them to leave. One of the most unnerving aspects of the incident was that the leader's voice seemed to grow louder and more insistent with each request. Then the other three joined in, almost chanting their demands that they be allowed to come in and get something to eat. That's when Carter overheard the police sirens off in the distance, seemingly drawing closer to his residence. It was only then that he realized that Suzanne had called the cops. As the squad came around the block, the boys simply disappeared. They vanished in the blink of an eye. All we could tell the police officers is that a gang of rowdy teens had been pounding on our door, but they ran away when they heard the squad car coming. When the officers asked for descriptions, we gave accurate descriptions except for the solid black eyes. In his 2009 book, Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side, Brad Steiger noted that sometime around 2003, he began receiving a number of letters from people describing their encounters with strange black-eyed beings. This is no doubt around the same time Brian Bethel's 1997 BEK encounter in Texas began making the rounds on the paranormal call-in shows and on the internet. It could be argued that people began to make up stories to follow a trend, although it's entirely possible that people had been having encounters with black-eyed people but did not tell anyone for fear that somebody would assume they were crazy. The fact that Bethel had this experience and shared it allowed other people who had the same experience to step forward and share it with less fear of ridicule. No doubt encounters with black-eyed human beings existed long before Brian Bethel. John Keel wrote of such beings in his books in the 70s. Similar black-eyed children were also reportedly encountered in 1974 in Ain, France, in a case that was investigated by Joel Mesnard. But these encounters weren't well known. We've all seen something that we decided not to tell anyone. Like you're driving down the highway going to work and you see a guy running across the road in a chicken suit. You tell yourself, that was weird, and you carry on. You might mention it to someone at work, but most likely you'll just forget about it. Although, later, if somebody at work claims they saw a guy in a chicken suit running across the highway, you suddenly feel compelled to corroborate the sighting, even, in many cases, sharing your own sighting. This is often how these things work. People often only share when they hear other people sharing. Unlike the other BEK sightings I'm aware of, these teens seemed capable of following the two couples around the city, apparently without the aid of a vehicle as no vehicle was sighted by the couples. 
Also, how did they know they were going to see a movie? How did they know which theater they intended to see the movie in? Seattle has around a dozen movie theaters, so that would be quite the guess. There are some researchers that believe these black-eyed being encounters are associated with the UFO phenomena. So this causes me to wonder, in those terms, had the leaders scanned Carter's mind during that initial encounter in the parking lot, the moment that they looked into each other's eyes, similar to how people claim extraterrestrials are able to read their minds after looking directly into their eyes. How else would they know? Another aspect that differs from many other Black Eyed Kids encounters was that they chose to ring the doorbell, rather than knock. Long steady knocking is a constant in these types of accounts, though in this case that did not happen. These kids seem to be almost toying with the couples, terrorizing them, letting them know no matter where they go, how far away they travel, they will be there watching them. I assume the decision to ring the doorbell rather than knock was deemed a more effective way of terrorizing Carter and his girlfriend. The remainder of the account, the request to be let in to use the phone and the bathroom were pretty standard. The last request, them wanting to eat, seems to fall in line with more traditional vampire lore, where vampires are only allowed to enter a residence if they are invited in, and in many cases this often ends with the vampire feeding on, or eating, the person that has invited them into their home. I get the sense that Steiger was intrigued by this account because of how closely it lined up with traditional accounts of vampires, as well as more Hollywood depictions, namely, the Lost Boys. Although neither Steiger or Carter come out and say it, I have to assume that these four male teenagers were able to follow these two couples around by flying, as was depicted in the film The Lost Boys, where Kiefer and his vampire crew surveilled their prey from the skies before moving in for the kill. Is that what was happening here? Were Carter, Suzanne, Greg, and Karen being followed around by the crew in hopes that they would stop somewhere remote, possibly to attack them? It's interesting to note that other people living in Seattle have also reported encounters with a group of creepy black-eyed young men. In 2011, writing on Reddit, a user going by the name of Freelancer47 claims that in early 2010, he was walking home when he was asked by a woman if he would walk with her to her car. He noted that she appeared to be spooked by something, and after some prodding, she revealed that she was being followed by, quote, some creepy-looking kids. The witness sensed that given that they were in downtown Seattle, it could be anything. She eventually pointed them out to the witness. They were standing a half a block away. He guided her across the street away from them. There were only two of them, but they were staring her down intensely, the witness recalled. As they walked, the witness locked eyes with the two young men. I didn't get scared or anything, but did notice something strange. They didn't break eye contact with me. Mind you, I don't look like the kind of guy you want to F with. People break eye contact with me constantly, but these two kids didn't. That was a red flag for me. The witness noted that he finally got the woman to her car and directed her to the local police station the Seattle PD West Precinct, which was only about five blocks from where they were at. It is unclear what happened next as the witness elected not to follow up his initial post, nor did he respond to any subsequent inquiries. On November 16, 2013, Thought Catalog included his report in an article entitled, 16 Terrifying Encounters with the Black Eyed Kids. In the summer of 1959, Shirley Tebow, driving from Aberdeen, Washington to Seattle, Washington, claims that she observed a man hunched over by the side of the road. Though not one to pick up hitchhikers, Tebow felt compelled to stop and give this man a ride. As he entered her car, Tebow instantly became frightened, to which the man said, Don't be afraid, Shirley. She had not introduced herself, yet the man knew her name. She noted that he was wearing a hat sitting very low so much so that she could not get a decent look at his eyes. As she drove, Tebow claims the man began telling her things about herself that she had never told anyone, things he couldn't possibly know. She sensed the man was reading her mind. This was all but confirmed when, after driving for quite some time, Tebow realized that she had no idea of her passenger's destination, to which he replied, Oh, this will be fine. Granted, at no point had she spoken the words out loud, but this man replied as if she did. When she let him out, she turned to watch him walk away, and he was gone. Ruth Montgomery detailed this case in her 1985 book, Aliens Among Us. 
She pointed out that a man living in Everett, Washington, also claims that he picked up a hitchhiker who seemed to read his mind mere weeks before Tebow's encounter. On January 15, 2010, a woman named Dinah, writing for the Freaky Brain blog, described a bizarre encounter she had one night while clubbing in Seattle. In her post, she claims that in 2009, three days before they were to ring in the new year, she and some friends had decided to do a pub crawl. Even though she had lived in Seattle for four and a half years, she had never experienced that city's nightlife. They spent the cold, wintry night going from one bar to another, eventually settling on one in Belltown, which was located down an alleyway. It was decided that Dinah would be the designated driver, and she had stopped drinking very early into the evening. Dinah recalls that she was feeling miserable. The place was packed and she and her friends had to push their way to the bar in order to get some drinks. Later, Dinah offered to get the next round for her friends who were sitting at their table. I pushed my way to the bar a second time to get the girls more drinks. Whilst I stood at the bar, I was flanked on the right by a group of men who were loud and crass, and to my left was a man probably six foot or so with dark short hair and wearing a grey t-shirt. I didn't pay much attention to anyone as my focus was to attract the bartender so I could order the drinks. The man on my left spoke to me but I couldn't decipher what I heard. I turned to look at his face and his stare was quite piercing. I noticed he had really dark eyes. But then he was backlit so part of his face was cast in shadow. He then touched my shoulder and said something. At first I couldn't interpret what he was trying to say. There was too much noise, music blaring, punters talking and laughing. It just sounded like a roar, until he touched my shoulder, and the noise just drifted away, similar to when one inserts earplugs to reduce noise. At first I couldn't comprehend what happened. I think I was dazed for a minute or so, and then he started to speak again, and I could hear him. He asked for my name, and I provided my real name without thinking. Then he asked who my friends were. The chit-chat carried on for a couple of minutes, and then he told me he was a vampire. I scoffed at the statement, and then he showed me his teeth. His teeth were nice, actually, bright and shiny, and he had slightly elongated canines. I didn't believe him. I thought the teeth were glued on, and thought my girlfriends must have bribed him to poke fun at my skeptical nature. I asked if he likes to roleplay as a vampire and became quite persistent in questioning. He was adamant he was a vampire and got frustrated, so I asked him to prove it. He said he could bite me to prove it, but I rejected that idea. I'm not naive to think blood disorders can't be passed on through a bite. He mentioned he knew where I was from, which I thought was easy since I have a British accent, where I work and roughly where I live now. I was astounded when he clearly stated I was from north of England, northern coast near Blackpool. Actually I was born in Preston, Lancashire, which is 15 minutes from Blackpool. He stated that I work for an aerospace company and that I live 40 minutes south of Seattle. He mentioned that I was married. The married part was obvious. I had my wedding ring on. Then he stated that I had a little girl. At this revelation I was truly nervous. I didn't believe he was a vampire, but a stalker. He knew too much about me. I wondered how he knew I had a little girl. I was actually panicking at this stage. I quickly walked away and pushed my way back to my friends. I didn't turn around to look at him and quickly told my friends what had occurred. We left the bar within minutes. We had to walk a little as we approached the car park. My friends noticed the vampire from the bar, standing next to a bus shelter. I quickly ushered my friends into the car park and got out of Seattle as fast as I could drive, hoping he didn't get a chance to see the license plate number. Over the past couple of weeks I have been questioned a multitude of times by my friends and have been asked to inspect every single aspect of that night. The night in question I was cold stone sober, so I know what I saw and heard. However, I am still dubious he was a vampire, but I am not sure what he was. I was definitely astonished that he knew so much about me. I can't explain how he knew so much. I am essentially a foreigner in this country and don't have much information spread everywhere as most US citizens. It is hard to track me unless you have access to immigration databases. Anyway, this is my weird story. You can interpret this tale how you wish. 
I have to admit, as I sat down to write this video, I was growing increasingly creeped out by the accounts I was finding. As much as I love the paranormal and I'm open to just about anything, the thought of vampires existing is hard for me to digest, but it does seem that something very strange is occurring in Seattle. In 1959, just outside Seattle, Shirley Tebow picked up a strange man who hid his eyes and seemed able to read her mind and vanish at will. In The Lost Boys, Edward Herman as Max, a quiet middle-aged owner of a video store, is revealed to be the real leader of the vampire sect. Was Tebow's passenger a real-life equivalent to Max? Then, beginning in 2003, a man named Carter describes a run-in he had with a group of four young men with black eyes who seemed able to read his mind and who were able to travel vast distances without the aid of a vehicle. This is very similar to the four males depicted in The Lost Boys. In late 2009, a woman named Dinah claims that she encountered a group of young men in a Seattle bar and proceeds to speak with a fellow with dark eyes who seems able to read her mind and who appears to follow her. Then, in early 2010, a man writes to Reddit describing his encounter with a pair of young men with black eyes who are following a young woman in downtown Seattle. Again, all these events happened in Seattle. All the cases are very similar and seem in keeping with vampires as we've come to know them through popular culture and movies and literature. In Dinah's case, the man claimed that he was a vampire and appeared to prove it. In his Humanoid Guides, Albert Rosales documents numerous supposed encounters with vampire-like beings. Even John Keel believed that vampires existed. In an interesting side note, Washington State has the fourth highest rate of open missing persons cases in the U.S. It kind of makes you wonder, could a vampire sect, like the one depicted in the film The Lost Boys, actually exist? A group of boys who never get old and who never die. A group of boys with dark eyes, the ability to read minds, and who can move from place to place without being seen. Vampires. Vampires.